is all about bigger and bolder and stronger, faster, more immediate. You may think that the best drink to study with is down to personal preference, to which I would say, and also science would say, you're wrong. These are the three best and three worst drinks to study with and stick to the end because we're gonna go over some common mistakes that I think a lot of students make. But first, let's start with the three best. Now, coming in at number three is of course, coffee. And it's one of those that has a therapeutic window. I think a lot of people overdo it, get addicted and reliant on stimulants like caffeine, the main active ingredient in coffee. And there are some downsides to that. So if you've ever experienced a crash after drinking coffee, that's definitely gonna ruin your day of studying. Caffeine withdrawal. So there are certain best practices when it comes to coffee because coffee tends to have a pretty high caffeine concentration, right? So in the first 90 minutes of the day, your brain is still clearing adenosine. Now adenosine is this chemical that builds up in the brain over the course of the day. And as it builds up and binds to its adenosine receptors, it signals to you that you're getting tired and fatigued. Caffeine is a competitive inhibitor. So it actually competes with the adenosine molecules at these receptors. So one thing I learned from Dr. Huberman is that in the morning, your adenosine levels actually haven't fully cleared. In your first 90 minutes of waking, your body is still working to clear it. So it's actually more beneficial to use caffeine after that first 90 minute window. Otherwise, you're more likely to crash later in the day if you have caffeine immediately upon waking. The second issue comes down to the dosing and the timing. So if you have caffeine too late in the day, obviously you're gonna disrupt your sleep. That's because caffeine, the main active ingredient in coffee, of course, has a half-life between two and 12 hours. Average for most people is around five hours. So for that reason, most people would benefit by not having any coffee after around one or 2 p.m. But again, if you're more or less sensitive, if you metabolize this caffeine faster or slower, you can actually change that window forward or back just a little bit. And of course, related to your metabolism of caffeine is also the dosing. So some people like to be sleep deprived and then they mega dose with caffeine thinking that's gonna solve their problem. But now you're yo-yoing in this sympathetic state and you can't get that good restful sleep. And you're in this constant cycle of being fatigued and doing more stimulants, being fatigued, doing more stimulants and it's not a path that you wanna go down. And the third issue comes down to the issue of tolerance and reliance. With coffee, because it has such a high dose of caffeine, you're more likely to see this issue here versus other drinks like tea, which we're gonna to get to shortly. So the thing to keep in mind is that you want your drink, whether it's coffee or whatever substance you're ingesting, to improve your performance. If you just get used to that, you develop a tolerance, and then the absence of it actually diminishes your performance, now you have this level of fragility and weakness that's ultimately holding you back. So it's actually beneficial to cycle your caffeine use and be mindful of the amount of caffeine that you're consuming on a regular basis. We actually have some best principles on how to approach coffee and caffeine consumption, both on this channel and on Med School Insiders. You can find the link up here and down in the description. And just to make sure I'm giving coffee its fair share of praise as well, you know, there's research about caffeine is beneficial in low arousal situations. It's an effective countermeasure to fatigue. It has many positive actions across the brain. It can increase alertness and well-being, help concentration, improve mood, and limit depression. Yet, yet, yet. We know that there's a lot of benefits to coffee. I think for most of us, the issue comes down to abusing coffee in a way where it starts to actually hinder our performance. By the way, a lot of people think it is necessary to drink coffee and ingest lots of caffeine if you're in an intense profession. Let's say, I mean, very common in med school and residency, where people won't even believe that you're not drinking coffee or caffeine, which is kind of laughable. Do drugs during the day and then still function, still do your job. How the fuck else would you do this job? Cocaine and hookers, my friend. I have inflammatory bowel disease. I tried a French press that I got as a gift back in med school. Tasted delicious, nice and naturally creamy, even when it's black coffee. But the laxative diuretic effects just didn't sit well with my gut. So after a few days of trying coffee, I was like, yeah, not for me and you can totally succeed and thrive without it. Number two is tea, which is my favorite drink of choice. I think tea is actually better than coffee in a few ways. But first, to help you understand why, let me tell you about America. America is all about bigger and bolder and stronger, faster, more immediate. And you can see that with a lot of areas of our life, right? Whether it's cars, let's Dodge Viper, eight liter V10, or whether it's our food, supersized drinks and massive proportions, it's the American way. And I think that can contribute to why a lot of us gravitate towards coffee and caffeine, because you get that large, immediate effect of a high dose of caffeine. Caffeine, yeah, baby! Tea is almost counter to that, because tea, generally speaking, it takes more time to brew. You can't just put in a, you know, go to your Keurig, press a button and then boom, you're ready to go. You're oftentimes doing multiple steeps, at least if you're doing the gong fu method of brewing tea, which is like the Asian method. There's also the, uh, the British method, which is kind of different, but it still usually takes more time. It's more of a process. Also, when you drink tea, not as high of a dose of caffeine, 
but it's also balanced with L-theanine. Now the combination of caffeine plus L-theanine gives you a very calm, alert, and focused state. Without that jitteriness, the headaches, a lot of the issues that you have from coffee, we have just too high of a dose of caffeine without something like L-theanine to help balance it out. Inner peace, inner peace. And similar to coffee, there's a lot of research on tea about its multitude of benefits. So looking at black tea, tea is a relevant contributor to our daily cognitive functioning and it improves attention and self-reported alertness. We have black tea consumption, sped the performance, improved memory, reduced the number of errors in various cognitive tasks, and our results further show that even small volumes of black tea consumption can speed up cognitive processing. And there are all these other benefits. You can see the same thing with coffee though, right? Like cancer preventing properties and cardiovascular risk and diabetes risk and arthritis and all that stuff. But let's be real, that stuff doesn't drive behavior change. I think a big reason why Americans don't drink more coffee is that we're used to tea bags. And tea bags, as we covered on our TikTok, essentially contains tea dust. It's very fine particles, not high quality, and because of the surface area to volume ratio, you're not quite getting a proper flavor. And even the tea bag itself leaches a lot of microplastics and other nastiness into your drink. My favorite is loose leaf tea, which you can learn more about in this video, but I only really do it at home because it's not as convenient. I've tried traveling with my loose leaf tea and various contraptions, but it's just too much effort, right? You have to do multiple steeps. It can sometimes be a little bit messy. It's just more of an involved process, right? And that actually brings us to today's sponsor, Peak Tea. Peak Life actually brings a lot of the benefits of tea without the time consuming process of brewing traditional loose leaf tea. So you're getting the convenience that you get with a lot of other drinks, but also that very unique calm and focused state that's unique to tea. My favorite is their Sacred Lily Oolong because I'm a huge sucker for oolong and this actually tastes really good. And you simply open up a single packet, you pour it into hot water and stir. That's it. It's a great way to enjoy high quality and great tasting tea if either you're new to tea and the brewing methods and all the various contraptions are a bit intimidating, or if you already love tea, but you want a more convenient way to consume it in your busy day-to-day -day life. And if you're exploring the benefits of intermittent fasting or multi-day fasting, they actually have a whole variety of fasting teas, which come in a bunch of tasty flavors. For a limited time, use my custom link, peaklife.com forward slash Kevin Jubal for 15% off your order, plus two free gifts, a rechargeable frother and a peak cup. Link in the description. And thank you to Peak Life for sponsoring this video. And this brings us to number one, water or soda water, which I know sounds boring, but when you do it right though, so tasty. One of the reasons I bring this up is that even a mild amount of dehydration can cause headaches, irritability, but also a measurable impact on your concentration, cognition, and attention. Huh? And obviously that sucks if you're studying. There's even this interesting study, Pawson et al, 2013, and they found that students who brought water to an exam actually achieved better exam grades than students who did not. Now, I used to think that sparkling water is nasty, but something about getting to your mid to late 20s I feel like most people start enjoying the taste of sparkling water. And there's a few things I love about it. The first is that if I'm having some oral fixation or like craving of, you know, munching on something or something sweet, sparkling water can oftentimes address that craving without having to consume some junky Snickers bar. Now I've been getting pretty excited about my carbonated water. I'm gonna share with you guys some secrets. The first thing is that the best sparkling water you can buy over the counter is Topo Chico. So although it tastes the best, the issue is that I think about a year ago, a report came out whereby it had higher levels of PFAs compared to what is recommended as a tolerable dose and compared to competitors, 9.76 parts per trillion. So because of this, I did what any reasonable, rational and normal person would do and completely obsessed over creating the best possible sparkling water. And it comes down to this. The first step is a reverse osmosis system. So we get really pure water, but pure water doesn't taste very good, right? So you actually get a remineralization filter that adds back minerals and also alkalinizes the water ever so slightly. So it tastes closer to spring water. You take that, but then you have to first cool it before you actually go to your carbonation machine. I got this Arc Carbonator 3, looks beautiful, works great, where you can actually carbonate the water and it literally tastes, the taste of the water is even better than Topo Chico, believe it or not. And the carbonation is almost at the same level. The key is you have to really cool the water before you carbonate it. And I found that just using the refrigerated water straight from your fridge is not cold enough. So I just take water, put it in a, in a carbonator bottle and then put it in the fridge because that way it gets to a cooler temperature. Yeah, I know, I care way too much about this stuff. I should probably spend my time doing other things. But real talk, it's practically as good as Topo Chico. And now onto the three worst drinks to study with. Number three coming in at pop, soda, and juices. Let's keep this one quick. So the main issue here is that when you're drinking something that's sugary and you don't have fiber, right? So smoothies versus juice, 
Smoothies have fiber, juices don't. Something sugary without fiber is gonna insanely spike your blood sugar. If you have a continuous glucose monitor, as I do here, you can actually see this in real time. It's gonna spike your blood sugar and you're gonna have a crash. So no, contrary to what you might've been told, having something that's real fruit juice doesn't make it necessarily healthy, right? The typical eight ounce cup of orange juice has 20 to 30 grams of sugar, which is five to seven teaspoons. And soda or pop, depending on where you are in the world, is actually even worse. A typical 12 ounce can of Coke has 39 grams of sugar. That's nearly 10 teaspoons. I mean, even if you add a spoon or two of sugar to your coffee, which is not ideal, still nowhere near as bad as a Coke. I'm gonna suggest that if you find it hard to kick the habit of soda, Try a LaCroix or other similar flavored sparkling water, something that has no calories and a milder flavor, because I've seen it help a lot of people actually kick the habit of soda altogether. Next, we have energy drinks, pretty bad offenders with both regards to caffeine and sugar. So a 250 milliliter can of Red Bull contains 27 grams of sugar and 80 milligrams of caffeine. And your typical 500 ml can of Monster has 160 milligrams of caffeine and 54 grams of sugar. The sugar and caffeine are the primary active ingredients but a lot of energy drinks actually contain other substances as well. Things like methyl xanthines, guarana, yerba mate, ginseng, ginkgo biloba. And there have actually been some interesting studies with regards to safety. So Ali et al in 2014 had the systematic review of energy drinks and they concluded that energy drink consumption is linked to increased substance abuse and risk-taking behaviors the most common adverse effects affect the cardiovascular and neurological systems. Shar et al. in 2017, in their mini review, found that there's emerging evidence that has linked energy drink consumption with a number of negative health consequences, such as risk-seeking behavior, poor mental health, adverse cardiovascular effects, and metabolic, renal, or dental conditions. And then finally, another systematic review by Ibrahim et al. 2021. A total of 32 studies and 96,000 individuals were included. Frequent adverse effects in the pediatric population were insomnia at 35%, stress at 35%, and depressive mood at 23%. Adverse effects in the adult population were insomnia at 24%, jitteriness, restlessness, and shaking hands at 29%, and GI upset at 21%. And number one, the absolute worst drink to study with is alcohol, which may sound ridiculous, but get this, a lot of people for creative work actually suggest a drink or two if you're of age. There's this common saying of, write drunk, edit sober. I, I can't write unless I'm drunk. I guess. This is actually pretty cool. In this study, alcohol and creative writing, they found that in the alcohol condition, within subject comparisons indicated significantly greater quantity of creative writing while intoxicated. These results were interpreted as supporting the belief that alcohol can reduce writer's block, at least among non-alcoholic subjects. But this is only for the creative process, and we're talking about pretty small quantities of alcohol. This definitely does not mean you should go to your college rager and then come back home to finish your essay. And while it might help get those creative juices flowing, it's definitely not for other forms of studying where you need to memorize, understand, and work with complex ideas. And that's it, my friends. Let me know your favorite study drink with a comment down below and check out these videos to optimize your caffeine and coffee consumption.